Welcome to the Dallas Schools Environmental Education Center on this beautiful winter day. Uh, we'd like to say a special welcome to Withers, College Hills College Station, Pure Foy, Walnut Hill, Pleasant Run, Solar Prep. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you enjoy and uh, the lesson that we're going to present today. If you have not registered and you're watching, if you would go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register and sign up, please. This is just for our attendance and so we can keep you informed of any future projects. Today, we're gonna to study soil formation. During this virtual field trip, students will discover that earth consists of natural resources and its surface is constantly changing. Students will explore how soils are formed by weathering of rock the decomposition of plants and animal remains. We'll do four sessions. Why is soil important by Mr. Broughton? Soils are formed by weathering by Mrs. Fuller. Decomposition in the post oak preserve by Ms. Nash. And decomposition in vermicompost by Ms. Ramirez. During this session, you can have uh, send in questions if you want. If you have questions, www.tiny.cc slash EEC dash question dash answer. Uh, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Mr. Broughton will tell you about why soil is important. Thank you, Dr. Gorman. Let me share my screen here and uh, we'll get started with a presentation on why soil is important. And soil is a very important natural resource. Uh, one reason you can kind of see here right in this first picture that soil is so important is it anchors plants roots to the ground. Soil also holds water and helps filter water and it holds nutrients. But speaking of uh, helping anchor plants to the ground, uh, since it's a virtual field trip, we're going to take a little virtual trip uh, northwest of Dallas. Uh, and also, we're going to go back in time about 100 years um, to talk about the Dust Bowl. Now, the Dust Bowl is an area that covers about half of Kansas, the Texas and Oklahoma panhandles, and a little bit of Colorado and New Mexico. And uh, what happened there? was um, in the 1920s, people were overusing that land. So they over cultivated the land to grow wheat, uh, but they, they plowed up too much land um, and, didn't, and didn't just, they just did a bad job of taking care of the land. Then in the early 1930s, the area suffered a severe drought. That area's exposed dry topsoil was able to be easily eroded by wind and something like this started happening. So those dust storms were called black blizzards, and that is when the wind would pick up the soil um, in that area of the Dust Bowl and, and blow it around. And I mean, it, it, it devastated uh, that whole area for almost 10 years. Thousands of families ended up having to leave and move somewhere else, and it was a, a pretty bad time. So you can see that's Texas in 1935. But here is Kansas in 1935. They were experiencing the same thing. The ground had been, you know, plowed up and was bare um, from too much uh, farming and not well. They still farm there today, but um, they're using better practices now. Uh, in the in the 20s and 30s, uh, they didn't know how to take care of the land um, the way we do now. And there's Oklahoma in 1937, and that's actually an abandoned farm. People finally just gave up and moved away. So it was. A terrible time to live in that area. Uh, it was like living in a desert, um, which you would not think there's a desert right there, and there there isn't. So, what ended up happening is the federal government had to get involved, and they uh, planted a lot of trees. So you can see there they they planted some trees. Um, those are three year old trees to, to stop the wind and hold the soil in place, and they started that in 1935 and and continued doing that. Uh, one project um, had the federal government overseeing the planting of 200 million trees in a 100 mile wide, 1000 mile long barricade designed to stop the wind erosion. And it did work. 
uh, by the 1940s, a lot of that land had recovered. And this is what it looks like today. So you can see the people that live in those areas are uh, taking better care of the land. They're not plowing it all up. They're, they're still farming there. Um, Kansas is called the wheat state. And if you ever go to Kansas, you will probably see fields of wheat there. Um, but they're doing a better job of taking care of the land. Here's another picture. So you can see they're letting the grass and trees grow. And that helps hold the soil in place because it is such an important resource. Without the soil, it would be tough to live. And there's one more picture of uh, an area in um, Kansas where they've allowed trees and grass to grow. So it's, it's much better now. It doesn't look at all like it did in the 1930s. But that, so holding the soil in place um, or you know, allowing plants to grow is one reason soil is so important. Another reason, so we're, we're, we were back in present day now and we will leave that the, the, uh, the Dust Bowl area. And this is Sunnyvale, Texas, um, pretty close to um, Dallas and pretty close to Seagoville where we're located. Um, and that is a friend of mine's backyard. And when I looked at that, I was like, what are you doing? And here's one more picture of him digging in the dirt there. And there you can see what he's doing and he is building a barn in his backyard. But it's important to get down to good soil and have a and put a good foundation for that barn to uh, um, have it last. If you're going to build a building and it's like a big expensive building, uh, like a house or a barn or, or a office building or apartments or anything like that, you want the soil to be good where you're located. Uh, you want the foundation to be good so that that building lasts a long, long time. Like I mean, you hopefully it'll last a hundred years if they if they build it right, which for how far he dug down, I'm pretty sure he's doing uh, um, it right. You can kind of see like the layers of soil in here too. It's interesting how what he has uncovered um, over there. Uh, so it's important to anchor plants. It's important to um, you know have a good foundation for buildings, and it's also important for how we grow our food. All all the plants that we eat grow in soil. If we don't have good soil, the plants won't grow. And, um, and uh, you know, we won't have food to eat. So there you can see our one of our gardens at our center there. Uh, that looks like uh, cucumbers to me, maybe. I can't remember what I planted. Um, but you can see that it's growing in nice, rich, uh, dark soil. And there's some tomato plants. They must be because I got the tomato cages around them growing in that soil. Um, it's important to have good fertile soil for your so your plants can grow. There's some corn growing again in the, in similar soil. Uh, all all the plants that we need to to live um, grow in the soil. So soil is extremely important for that. That is some uh, crookneck squash, is my guess. It's got to be squash or zucchini. There's okra which is a, a plant that originates, originates from Africa, but we can also grow it here in Texas, and it is growing in the soil. There's some more tomato plants. So you can see they've, they got bigger after some uh, weeks went by. That is, um, well, this is watermelon, and I think this huge leaf here is a zucchini leaf. So I had a couple things going on um, in that spot. But you, again, I kind of got a picture of the good soil that grows, that they grow in. And if we wait long enough and have good enough soil, uh-oh. I don't know why my PowerPoints are doing that lately. Let me just try this one more time. Huh. Well, we're going to have to look at it this way. That's not even wanting to show up. Well, I had a picture of a watermelon, so you can kind of see it right here, but it's not wanting to show up on the slide for some reason. Let me try one last thing and see if this works. There it is. <laughs> little glitch in the little glitch in the internet or something. So there's a watermelon and and um you can eat that. Uh, we can feed that to animals that we have living out here. And uh, it, so like 
a lot of the food that we feed our animals grows in the soil. If it, if it weren't for that, we would have a tough time um, surviving. I mean, without soil, it would be really be tough for, for any life to exist. And now we kind of looked at what's happening more up towards the surface, but there's a whole world of life uh, growing underground as well. So I found a quick picture of a food web at, of, in the soil and you could see like mammals, uh, like little rodents, and that's a mole depend on soil. Uh, there's plants anchored in the ground. Birds depend on the soil because the insects that they eat live in the soil. Uh, there are worms and protozoans and bacteria, uh, decaying matter, fungi, all kinds of things down in the soil living. There's a whole world of, of um, microscopic and larger things uh, down in the soil. And without the soil, none of that could exist. We would have an extremely uh, difficult time surviving without soil. So that is uh, why soil is important. Um, if you have any questions, Dr. Gorman will be able to answer those for you. Thank you, Mr. Broughton. Yes, we do have a question. And it is, can you give another example of why soil is important? And yes, going along with what Mr. Broughton told you about the dust bowl, scientists and historians have determined that the demise of the Mayan empire, which was a very advanced empire many, many hundreds of years ago, uh, the demise came about because of mismanagement of the soil. They didn't take good care of it, and apparently it ended up very much like the Dust Bowl did, only this actually caused the demise of a whole race of people. And now Ms. Fuller is going to tell you about soils formed by weathering. Good afternoon, boys and girls. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about weathering in this segment. And weathering is the breaking down of rock not the moving of rock particles, just the breaking down part. The moving part's called erosion. We're only covering weathering in this segment. <clears throat> the three types of weathering we're gonna cover are biological weathering, physical weathering, and chemical weathering. We're gonna start with physical weathering because I'm gonna start with something called ice wedging or frost action or freeze thaw. And I've got a rock over here that has ice in it. And if I wait any longer, the ice will be gone. So let me get this and show it to you. This rock is called coquina. It's full of fossil shells. But can you see that ice in there? I filled it with water, stuck it in the freezer. What that's going to do is it's going to crack the rock and cause it to fall apart. Ice wedging works. It breaks, things, breaks rock apart because the water molecule, when it freezes, it expands, it gets bigger. It doesn't contract. Most things, when they get real cold on our planet, they contract, but ice actually expands. Water actually expands when it freezes into ice, and that's because of the structure of the ice molecule. All right, so that's a big one right there. There's a, a lot of rock that gets broken by ice wedging. It's also called freeze thaw. It's also called uh, frost action. Now, another one is glacial action. <clears throat> At, you know about the Ice Age because you saw that movie, the uh, um, Ice Age movie with the little squirrel. And uh, that was a real thing that happened. And uh, the top part of the United States was covered in glaciers. And these glaciers were about a mile thick. They were huge. And ice is very heavy and it just ground the rock into powder. So that's another physical uh, weathering type was glacial action. And let me tell you something, in physical weathering, the rock is simply broken. It's not changed into anything else. It's just broken, all right? And then another one's wind. And if you go in the desert, there's a lot of wind in the desert and it'll pick up pieces of rock and knock it against any rock formations and knock pieces off. And we're gonna talk in a minute about the sand in the Sahara Desert. Okay, and then the last one we're gonna talk about is exfoliation. Exfoliation is where a large 
a rock formation like a bath lift, like an enchanted rock down near Fredericksburg or a half dome in Yosemite. It's a huge piece of granite and it's got layers. And as the, the rock is lifted up, it expands and that top layer cracks and it exfoliates, it, it goes off and it breaks it up. So that's physical weathering for you. The next one's biological. Biological are things like lichens and plant roots and uh, some burrowing animals will burrow down into uh, rocky formations and uh, tear it up. So biological is another type of weathering. The last one is called chemical. Let me get this and show it to you. And the three types that we're gonna talk about for chemical weathering are acid rain, oxidation, and hydrolysis. Now, hydrolysis is essentially what we have here in this area that caused our soils to be so heavy in clay. There's a water action working on the materials that were laid down during the Cretaceous period, the water breaking it down and turning it into clay particles. And there, in soils, we've got three types of uh, size fractions. We've got sand, like this, and then we've got silt, which is like powdered rock, and then we've got clay, and clay particles are extremely tiny. So let's, uh, let's look, uh, so we've talked about hydrolysis, let's talk about oxidation. Now you know about oxidation. If you've ever left a toy or a tool in the backyard and you took it in, it was covered in that brown crusty stuff. That's rust, it's oxidation. Now this is a piece that fell off our plow and I was out in the pasture and I picked it up. It's probably two or three years ago. But you think I could put this back on the plow and we could plow successfully with it now? I don't think so, because it is so weak. You see all this brown crusty stuff on there, all that oxidized iron? Okay, that'll flake off and that'll form uh, little bits of sediment. And, uh, but we're not gonna be able to use this anymore. It's ruined. It's ruined by oxidation. The iron in this piece from the plow interacted with oxygen and with water and it rusted. All right, so that's it, that's oxidation. Now, the last one we're gonna talk about is acid rain. And normal rain is slightly acidic. Um, uh, on the pH scale, seven is neutral. That's the same thing as uh, the water your mother puts in an iron distilled water. That's got a pH of seven. If it gets above seven, it's very basic. If it gets below that, it's gonna be acidic. And that's not good for the rocks, it breaks it down. So I'm gonna give you a demonstration of that. Here is some calcium carbonate, and I'm gonna add some acid to it. And you can see it's already starting to bubble and fizz. I don't think you can hear it. But can you hear that? I can hear it, but I don't know if you can or not. But look at all that, all that bubbling going on in there. It's what's happening is that acid is breaking down that calcium carbonate and turning it into something else. It's breaking it, but it's, it's causing it to change into calcium acetate. So remember in physical weathering, the rock is simply broken, but in chemical weathering, it's changed chemically into a different substance. So in the case of the acid rain, it's changed in the calcium acetate. In the case of oxidation, it's, uh, it's changed into rust. And in hydrolysis, remember it changed the um, calcium carbonate type of rock that we have here into clay. So I'm gonna show you three different sizes. Okay, so this is a, a little device that podologists, those are people who study soil, use to determine the size of sand. So we've got these three big, pieces here. The, this size is called coarse. These two also are called coarse sand. 
These are medium sands and that's a fine sand. Down at the bottom is what we call silt. It feels like powdered rock. So we've got these three fragments, sand, silt, and um, clay. And our soil here in this area has a high component of clay. Now, these are all different sands from all over the world. I told you I'd talk to you a little bit about sand. Mo about 80% of the deserts in the world don't have sand. We always think of deserts as being these beautiful places that look like giant beaches and stuff, but 80% don't have sand. But the Sahara Desert has sand that's so deep, it's about 141 feet deep. Well, where did that sand come from? Well, during the Cretaceous period, there was a lot of sandstone that got weathered and it was deposited in a shallow sea. And guess where the shallow sea is now? It's where the Sahara Desert is now. So that's where all that sand came from. It came from sandstone that was broken down physically and into sand and then deposited there. Okay, um, I think I'm about out of time. If you have any questions about sand, silt, clay, or uh, weathering, um, Ms., uh, Dr. Gorman, we're glad to answer those, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. And one of the main questions that we had uh, was what type of weathering is the most prevalent? And that all depends on the weather. If the weather is hot and humid, we'll have chemical weathering. If it is uh, very, no, if it's yeah, hot and humid, if it is a dry climate, then we will have more of physical weathering. And next we're going to hear from Ms. Nash about decomposition in the Post Oak Preserve. Welcome to my classroom. Today we're gonna to be talking about decomposition. Today we're talking about soil, why it's important and how is it made. So we just heard about weathering. So soil has rocks in it or tiny bits of rock that are formed by weathering. And it also has organic matter. Organic just means it's alive or was once alive. So we went for a walk in the post up preserves the other day. It's a beautiful time of year to be out. It, since it's Texas, we still have beautiful fall color. A lot of leaves have fallen. We're crunching along. And there are leaves everywhere. Piles and piles of leaves, big logs and branches down. And you think, that's just one year of leaves. Wow. Every year, leaves fall. Every year, branches fall, trees fall. How come we can still walk around? Why are we up to here in leaves? Good question. The answer is decomposition. It's a big word, decomposition. So if I say I'm gonna compose the symphony, no, I couldn't do that, but if I could, I would take all the different instruments and give them a part and they would all play together. I would compose it, put it together. If I'm decomposing something, I'm taking it apart. So all this organic matter, plants, animals, dead things, live things, when they die, they're going to get taken apart. And some animals are involved in this, but most of that work of the recycling of organic matter is done by the fungi. Now, you may have seen mushrooms growing around. You may have eaten some occasionally. Well, mm. but they're everywhere. And the mushroom part is just the tip of the iceberg because underground there's a giant web of mushroom. And you can find all different weird kinds out there. I see that one, a little black -like fungi. Here's a big one, isn't that cool? Look at that. Okay. All different kinds. And when we look at leaves, we can see Fuzzy stuff. See that fuzzy? How fuzzy it is? That's fungi. 
see the spot. Fun. See all these fuzzy threads? That's fungi too. And the fungi are decomposing all of these things back into soil. It takes them a while. And we're gonna go see what we found when we went for our walk. So everybody knows about the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom, but there's another kingdom out there, the kingdom of the fungi. And just as important, really, those are the big three. And fungi are so amazing, they come in just fantastic shapes and colors. They're never green, but we've seen yellow ones and orange ones. We even have red ones out there, these little puff balls. They're so amazing and they're everywhere. So when you see the mushrooms, it's just the fruiting body. It's going to make the spores that reproduce the new mushroom guy. But underground, there's a thing called the mycelium and the hyphae of the growing tips. And that's what's threading through the whole forest floor. And also, when you see it on the leaf, that's what you're seeing. So we went for our walk. Just a beautiful day. Still some leaves on the trees. A lot of them are bare. And then we started looking for fungi. And of course, it had been really dry. So we, had, we didn't have any mushrooms. So we have some of these shelf fungi or bracket fungus that are um, more drought tolerant or they last longer. A mushroom will come up, it'll be there for a couple of days and then it's gone. But the, the, this kind stays around. You also see some nice moss on that branch. And of course, there's beautiful leaves everywhere. Here's another nice one. So those are like little cups and they're kind of dried up and, and over now, but they had the spores inside when they opened up like that. And some lichen on that, that log too. The lichen is also really interesting because it's algae plus fungi. And it does, it's not a decomposer like the fungi, it does photosynthesis, but it's really interesting. Another fun thing to learn about. So all through the forest, are all these big trees and big branches down, and every single one is covered in this little fungi, the little um, turkey tail, the little turkey tail, the little turkey tail fungus everywhere. These have been down a couple of years, and they'll last a few more years. It takes the, the big branches a long time to decompose. So the bigger they are, the longer it'll take them to decompose. So this one had been there for a pretty long time. And when I kind of pulled it apart, I just got this just crumbly stuff, just like back to soil, to just turn back into soil. And that's a hard job because these big trees have a lot of what we call lignin in them, which is super strong. That's why trees can grow so tall and bend and hold up that tremendous weight of the tree is that substance called lignin. And the fungi are the only ones that can really break, digest that. Okay, and break it down, decompose it. So here's the top of the forest floor, and we call this leaf litter. It's a good kind of litter. And these are leaves that fell this year, about a month or so ago, they started falling. These are our post oak leaves. You can see a lot of holes in those leaves. So the caterpillars were having a little dinner or two before they fell, while they were still green. They don't like to eat them now. So if you go down another layer, you can move those big ones off the top. And you find another layer. And these leaves fell when, if you're in third grade now, when you were in second grade, these are leaves that fell. But now they're like dark in color and they've kind of broken into little smaller bits. Go down another layer. And now we see leaves that fell when you were in first grade. And now they're almost unrecognizable as the leaves. You can't even tell what they are. They're just like crumbly bits. And they really, after that, they're gone. They're, when you, the leaves that fell when you were in kindergarten have become soil. So I took this special tool and I took a core sample. So I just push it down into the soil and I pull it out. And then you see like two inches of that dark, crumbly organic matter, that soil, that good yummy soil for the trees on top. And under that sand. Now, Mr. Fuller said that most of our soil here is that dark clay soil, 
But out here in the Flagstaff Preserve, we have the sand underneath. And when you look and you kind of dig around in it, you find all the roots of all those trees are right in that very top layer. Because that's where all the water is and all the nutrients. That sand, the water just runs right through it. So when you see a leaf and you see these weird colors, right? That purple kind of weird pink color. These are, this is a fungi and those black spots, that's all fungi. So this is starting the process of decomposition on this leaf. And you look at it under a microscope and I just took that with this little Brock microscope and my iPad and you can see the thread. See those threads, that's the fungi. So these second and third layers, you can see they're kind of getting mixed in with that soil. So the sand is mixing in with that organic matter, acorns, twigs, dead animals, whatever, mixing in with a little bit of sand. And then the sand itself, you can see on the right-hand side under the microscope, you can see it's just like little rocks, okay? So it has hardly any organic matter in it, okay? and the rain will just run right through that. So the plants really appreciate that organic matter because it holds the rain. I'm gonna stop sharing. And I would like to encourage you to go for a walk of your own and go out and see what you can find. You can take a hand lens with you. You can find all kinds of amazing things, okay? Beautiful leaves to look at. Fungi to find. But fine. I found this out there, a wasp nest, no wasp left, but really interesting to see. It's going to be decomposing also. A, a branch with some good lichen on it and some fungi underneath. So all kinds of fun things to find. You can draw pictures, okay? You can make a little collection of the leaves, okay? So lots of fun things to do, and I encourage you to get outside. Thank you, and Dr. Gronin will answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Nash. One very interesting question that came in, I thought, was how long does it take things to decompose in the post oak preserve? Uh, most of the leaf litter, I believe, will be gone in about a year or be decomposed back into the soil. But the oak trees over there, if one of them falls, it can take between 46 and 71 years for it to completely decompose. Thank you. And now we will hear from Ms. Ramirez about decomposition and thermal composting. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be observing, comparing, and describing a vermicompost soil. So you might be asking, what exactly is a vermicompost? Well, a vermicompost is just a box that has hundreds of worms, and I actually feed these worms all of my leftover food and garbage, and they will help to decompose it. So Ms. Uh, Ms. Nash already used this word before, and decompose just means to break down. So it's making leaves and other food stuff into smaller pieces, and eventually it will become part of our soil. And uh, we know that things get broken down or decomposed from decomposers. So Ms. Nash already talked to you guys about mushrooms and fungi, how they also help to break down and decompose stuff. But other things like insects, uh, worms and bacteria are also decomposers. They also help to break down all of that dead stuff that we see outside. So what I'm gonna do with you guys, I'm gonna share my iPad screen with y'all and we're gonna take a look inside my verma compost. So again, my verma compost is just a box that has worms inside of it. And it might take me just a second to connect my iPad. Um, so let me start that uh, screen share with you guys. And I think y'all are seeing my screen. Let me just get the orientation in the right direction. There it goes. And I'm gonna walk on over to our verma compost. And so you can see here, this is my verma compost. It's just a black tub and I drilled holes in it. And the holes are there because the worms need air too. So just like we need air to breathe, the worms need air too. And why do you think my box is dark? Do you think the worms like the light? So worms are very sensitive to the light. So if you go outside, you're probably not just gonna see worms wiggling around out in your yard. You have to actually dig for them. And that is because they don't like the light. 
So I have my worms in a dark plastic box. Now, since these are my pet worms, I feed them different stuff than an outside worm might eat. So my pet worms actually like to eat grass. I give them some leaves. But they also eat a lot of my fruits and vegetables. So when my fruits and vegetables go bad in the refrigerator, since I don't eat them fast enough, uh, when they start to go bad, I actually just throw them inside this box and the worms will get to eat them. Now, a vermicompost is really good to have because it's a way for us to make our own humus. Uh, so humus is just a rich, rich mixture of the decomposed or broken down remains of plants and animals. So inside my vermicompost, we are actually using worms to break down my leftover food. And you can make humus on your own when you have your own compost bin. And it's a great thing for the environment because you're decreasing your garbage. So instead of just throwing away that apple or orange or lettuce that went bad, you can actually use it for food to feed the worms. And so I'm gonna go ahead and take off our little lid and we're gonna see what's inside. So you're gonna use your observation skills. Uh, maybe describe what are you seeing right now? Do you see any leftover food? Do you see any worms? Um, the newspaper is like the bedding for the worms. I keep it wet so that they have uh, some moisture inside, but I have some uh, potato peel. I have some leftover cucumber in that I didn't wanna eat. And I'm just gonna dig around just a little bit and we'll see if we can find any worms. So do you guys see any worms yet? And I actually see one right there. So let me see if you'll let me pick him up. So I actually have like hundreds of these little red worms inside this box. And um, I started out with about 100 worms about eight years ago and I've never had to read fill my box. So they keep having babies and I keep having more worms. And the more worms you have, the more they need to eat. Um, and I probably don't give them enough food that they need. Uh, but you can see the soil texture in here. Describe the color and the texture of the soil in the vermicompost. So it's this rich black color. It's also very moist. And then we can see our little red worm in there as well. I'm going to go ahead and show you one last thing. Um, since Miss Nash was showing you guys some pictures of the forest floor, uh, so remember that leaf litter? Here's some examples of that leaf litter. So you can see the bigger leaves were at the very top. And as we were digging down, you can see that the leaf size and the particle size got smaller as we dug. And then so a question that we often get is what's in soil? So what do you guys think is in soil? So we already learned with Miss Nash that a lot of our soil has those leaves and sticks. And we know that the leaves and sticks get broken down from decomposers. But we also have things like water inside our soil. So whenever it rains, that rainwater uh, gets absorbed into the soil. Mrs. Fuller went over rocks. So we know that there's rocks in soil and we know that those rocks get broken down into smaller pieces by weathering. And something a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of our soil has animal remains. So when animals die, we can actually, uh, their dead body and their fur, all of that stuff can, will eventually incorporate into our soil. So here I have some animal fur and bones. I have some bird feathers and snake skin. And then I have this cool animal skeleton that I found outside. Now, if I were to leave these things outside, eventually over time, decomposers like the fungi, my worms, mushrooms, all of that stuff would break down and eat away at all this dead stuff and it would become part of our soil. And another thing that we can find inside soil is this stuff. So what is this? So this is poop, it's not real poop, it's a replica, so it's a model, but it's a model of coyote poop. Now out here in the Post Oak Preserve where we are, we have lots of animal poop or waste. And the science name for poop is scat. Um, so eventually this poop or scat will also be broken down by decomposers and it will become part of our soil. Now I have two large dogs at home and I know a lot of the soil that I have in my backyard is probably contains a lot of my dog poop. So that's why it's a good idea that whenever you're touching dirt or soil, that you always wash your hands after touching soil because you never know uh, what made up that soil. 
So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my iPad screen. And then we're going to look at a super quick little PowerPoint of some videos of those worms actually moving. So now I'm going to share my computer screen with you guys. And we're going to take a look um, at these worms. So let me start that presentation. Now those worms, I put the worms in there, but there's actually other things inside my worm box that I did not put in there. Things like the springtail, these cute little tiny white insects, and things like these mites. These mites are super tiny and they're related to spiders, so they're arachnids. And then um, sometimes I'll throw my leftover potatoes that get too soft, I'll throw them in there, and sometimes they actually sprout or grow. And then we also get some weird molds and fungi growing inside my worm bin too. So here is a little video of the worms actually moving. So you're gonna be a good scientist. You're gonna see if you can draw and maybe discuss what you're observing. And I have a little scavenger hunt for you guys. See if you can find a worm cocoon. So the worm cocoon is gonna be an orange or yellow spherical shaped thing. And it actually has worm eggs inside. So as I play the video, Keep an eye out for the worm eggs and the tiny little insects and creatures that are moving around the soil. So the soil again, you can tell it looks pretty wet or moist because you can see it's shining. You can also see the worm is slowly wiggling. And hopefully by now you were able to spot that orange uh, worm cocoon and it's right over here. And then hopefully you guys were also able to find at least a few of those little springtails crawling around in the soil as well. Now those little springtails are not harmful. Um, they're just other decomposers that happen to find their way inside my little worm box. So my next slide, let me fast forward, um, is gonna be a close up of those little springtails. So again, I'm gonna play it two times. The first time, see if you can spot the little white springtails by yourself. So they're super tiny and they crawl super fast. And then this time I'm gonna go ahead and show you in case you missed it the first time. So if you pay attention to this worm on the lower right, you'll see at least five of them crawling. And then in this still picture, you can see one right here and one right here. So super cool, the tiny microscopic things you can find inside my worm bin. And then just some quick things about the worm. Worms don't have teeth. So we have teeth so that we can chew our food. Worms don't have teeth. So they're chewing their food through a special body part called a gizzard. Think about Thanksgiving. During Thanksgiving, you probably ate a turkey gizzard. Uh, so turkeys don't have teeth either. They also have a gizzard. Uh, that gizzard, what ends up happening is um, the worm will eat small pieces of rock or sand and it goes inside the gizzard and mixes with the worm's food. And that gizzard helps to crush it. Uh, so that's how they're crushing their food. And then this is black gold. Black gold is just another name for worm castings. And that is just another name for worm poop. So that worm poop or black gold is super nutritious for plants. It has a lot of good nutrients that the plants need to grow. So if you were to hold that stuff, it would be rather moist. The little particle size, they're very tiny and it's a deep, rich black color. And then here's a little video of decomposition of a pumpkin. So inside that bin, there's actually worms and other decomposers that are slowly starting to break down that pumpkin over a period of about two months. Um, so it's cool to, something easy that you guys can do at home or at school is just leave a piece of fruit or vegetable outside and see how it changes over time. Uh, those decomposers will slowly start to break it down until eventually it becomes part of the soil as well. So that's a cool little experiment that's super cheap that you guys can do at home or at school. And then the next thing um, is just a quick little video, I'll just skip around. So as Ms. Nash said, we went for a walk yesterday and this is just what we saw on our walk yesterday. So you can see those beautiful trees. Some of those trees have fallen and it will take years for them to completely break down. You can see the leaf litter there. Uh, that's the top. I dug a little bit and you can see the broken up leaves underneath. There's even a little snail there. So the snail is another decomposer too. Um, and then Miss Nash showed you guys that cool little uh, device that she used to take a, a sample of the soil underneath. And then my scavenger hunt for you guys, see if you can find two different types of soil and describe their color, their texture, so how does it feel, and its size. 
And then we learned a lot about decomposers today. So see if you can find examples of decomposers. Ms. Nash showed you all sorts of cool mushrooms. And then I showed you guys some of those um, invertebrates like our worms and those little bugs. Uh, so see what you guys can find on your scavenger hunt. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop our screen share and we're gonna pass it to Dr. Gorman and he's gonna answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Maris. Uh, we do have one question about yours, which is how long does it take uh, in the vermal compost bin for it to completely change into uh, good soil and anywhere from three to six months, according to what kind of the product you put in there and the condition of your soil. It takes two pounds of worms, 24 hours to make one pound of soil. Okay, I have about a hundred questions that came in, but due to our time, we're going to have to get out and uh, stop for the day. During this field trip, virtual field trip, students discovered that Earth consists of natural resources and its surface is constantly changing. Students explored how soils are formed by weathering of rock and the decomposition of plant and animal remains. Uh, Mr. Broughton told you why soil is important. Ms. Fuller told you about weathering. Ms. Nash covered decomposition in the post oak, where Ms. Ramirez did decomposition in vermal composting. 